Hello everybody, do not adjust your television sets or wherever you're watching this video on because I am Gareth here from What Culture Wrestling. We still haven't found Adam Cleary, which is a bit of a problem because there's a lot of things that he normally does around the place that we've not been able to do because he's gone. But I've taken over this NXT malarkey and I'm quite enjoying it because it was the go home show, the go home edition of NXT for NXT War Games take over the thing that is happening on Sunday. And there was a lot that we need to get into, a lot of great matches, a lot of interesting, let's say interesting segments. So without further ado, let's talk about the ups and downs from NXT. Right, so straight away, the, the entire show started with Damian Priest in the ring doing all of his Archer stuff, and it was announced that... Right, I need to make an apology here, because last week I called Kurt Stallion, Chris, Kurt, Curtis, Chris, because it was something that I think Legado del Fantasma would take the mick out of him in one of their backstage segments. I don't know an awful lot about Kurt Stallion, so I just went along with what they called him, and that is not his name. But he was attacked in the most dangerous place in all of WWE. He was attacked in the NXT car park before the night even really got underway. So Damian Priest drafted himself into the match and paired himself with Leon Ruff because he wanted to ensure that Leon Ruff made it to NXT TakeOver, which is an interesting move. This was a tag team match against Legado del Fantasma, but in my eyes, if I was Damian Priest, surely you'd want Leon Ruff to be in the worst shape possible so you could win your belt on Sunday. But it is what it is. The match itself was quite what you expect, really. Damian Priest was a big bully, battering everybody. Leon Ruff was trying to be as plucky as anything, but he kept getting battered by Legado del Fantasma. And it was looking like Damian Priest had full control at one point in the match, but then out of nowhere, he looked towards the barricade and he saw one of the Ghostface people, which have been popping up all over the place on NXT, wherever Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae have been involved. They've been there. And it distracted him, so Legado del Fantasma got back into the match and, yeah, started to be quite dominant. But in the end, they could not handle the team of Leon Ruff and Damian Priest because it was looking like Damian Priest was going to go for the reckoning. He did his like big arm thing and then Leon Ruff was like, no, I got this, which really made me giggle because he's just so plucky and he can do whatever he wants that man. He can do no wrong in my eyes and he did a frog splash then. Did a frog splash after Damian Priest had done the reckoning move and they won the match, which was, yeah, what I pretty much expected going into this. But then something quite odd happened at the end of this because we had Johnny Gargano sat a commentary being a bit like, oh, I'm going to get you both on Sunday and then behind him, Two Ghostface people popped up. So there are there how many ghost faces are there? Because there was Indy Hartwell at one point that we pretty much assumed was the ghost face. She was the ghost face person. Now there's another two. Is this gonna be the debut of a tag team in a ghost face squad? Some spooky stuff is probably going to be going down at TakeOver with these Scream people. But for now, this match itself, in isolation, it gets an up. After this, then we had a little quick highlight of the Pete Dunne, Kyle O'Reilly ladder match, which was absolute carnage last week. Yeah, it, w it was really, really aggressive and almost as painful to watch again. I'm not going to give it an up or a down. I'm just going to say it happened and yeah, what a match. Then we had another segment of Shotzi Blackheart building her tank backstage because like I said last week, that is just what she does now. But this time she's got a few new additions to her team because if you've been watching on social media, been watching on Twitter, she's recru recruited Ember Moon and Rhea Ripley to her team. So you've got two massive big hitters there, two superstars on this in this division right now, this women's division. And they gifted Shotzi an engine because Shotzi likes, likes tanks, likes vehicles, likes machinery. And she said, I think I'm in love. So you heard it here first, Shotzi Blackheart is in love with an engine. And then we had like a, a, a strange segment, but it did work, I think, at the end when you kind of summed everything up. But we had the Undisputed Era going on. What I thought at first was going to be very similar to like the Inner Circle's Vegas trip, where they just go to Vegas and get absolutely smashed and loads of escapades and all the rest of it. But they didn't. They had more of a serious, let's say, evolution-esque trip into Vegas. They're all suited up they went to a restaurant they were drinking wine they were like we need to reflect we need to talk about who we are as undisputed era and then they show loads of clips of what they've done in the past like they've had the war games matches in the past and just been absolutely dominant and it was pretty paid by numbers stuff but it got me really excited because i was like yes this is the undisputed era they've battered everybody they've been so dominant yes they're facing probably the biggest test they've ever faced but if anybody can overcome it these guys can so purely because they were yeah dressed in suits and just being really not cocky but presenting themselves as big deals i'm, I'm gonna give this an up for now but later on in the night i may have to maybe retract this up but i'll, I'll figure it out when i get there so next up we had everybody's favorite program let's call it the cameron grimes dexter Loomis 
escapades that have been happening every single week. But as the same thing happened last week, we had this match here with Cameron Grimes involved. He was taking on an up-and-comer. This time it was August Grey. And they had a, a really quick, really brief... It, it was technically a glorified squash because Cameron Grimes did just batter him in the end. But there was a little bit of a back and forth at one point. But he won via cave-in. And I was like, yes, in isolation now, if this, if this just happened, this was just a Cameron Grimes match and he just won the match, he's going to the moon and he'd done that last week as well, we'd be looking at Cameron Grimes right now thinking, well, this guy's really dominated. He just keeps beating people up and just, yeah, he's, he's going to the moon. It's going to be great. But of course, because this is Dexter Loomis territory, no, we can't have that. So after the match had ended, he got his strap that he'd pulled out of his sack this week, which was a reverse of what happened the week before, because that's what Dexter Loomis did. And he tied himself to August Grey, started beating the hell out of him. And then August Grey rolled out of the ring. Cameron Grimes was just bo boasting, just gloating, being all Cameron Grimesy. And Dexter Loomis then sneaked into the ring, popped up, and started beating him up and whipped him out of the ring. And it ended, this entire in ring thing ended yet again with Dexter Loomis just looking at the camera like this. It's getting it down, obviously, because I'm just, I'm, I'm just fed up. I'm fed up with it. I want it to end. I hope it ends. It is going to end on Sunday, fingers crossed, in this strap match these i just want to see something more entertaining more than anything because this is just not entertaining it's tedious i can see what's coming a mile off and it's my absolute biggest pet peeve with wwe storytelling where you can just you can smell it coming and what you can smell coming isn't the thing you like smelling all right so this next one i'm just going to keep really brief but it is an up straight away because we're going to talk about the jake atlas and tony nice match which was it was an exhibition for want of a better phrase and it did exactly what it needed to do because both guys had had their moments in the match, but Tony uh, Tony Nice was not the the let's say the person who the spotlight was on in this match. It was all about Jake Atlas. He gave a little well, he didn't give the tribute per se. It was it was mentioned on commentary that he was dedicating the match itself to Pat Pattinson, the mem memory of Pat Pattinson. Who I just want to say a little something about that. Obviously, like wishing all the best to him and his family. Pat Pattinson's an absolute legend of the business. It was awful news when we found this out yesterday. So yeah, just our thoughts and feelings go out to everybody in the Pattinson family and all of his friends. But like I said, the focus here was on Atlas. He won the match and he won it by showing off a bit of, obviously the heart that he's always got, but he showed a bit more aggression, which was something that Wade Barrett was really getting across on commentary. And he, he did it again in the in the interview after the match. He wasn't aggressive, like turning heel and being like, oh, I'm going to beat everyone up to get the belt. He was just, he was showing that passion, just showing that grit that he just wanted to be better. And he's obviously got his eyes set on the Santos Escobar and the Cruiserweight Championship later down the line. But if this means we're going to see him week after week challenge like people and overcome people and just slowly build himself up to a high ranking spot i'm totally here for this this is how you build a star and after this the main event it wasn't the main event but he is the main event in my eyes of nxt week after week after week pat mcafee he arrived on the scene he arrived midway through that tony nice uh, jake atlas match in a hummer which is you know it's just what pat mcafee does but he got into the ring and absolutely slammed that undisputed era segment that i was talking about before and some of the things he had to say were just just downright offensive he blasted the tuxedos as being like rented horrible tuxedos that he could just get anywhere. He was like, oh, they were drinking boxed wine. They were pushed to the back of a restaurant right near the kitchen because the actual restaurant owners didn't want to be seen dead with this undisputed era team in their establishment. And yeah, he completely ripped apart everything that I thought was quite cool and funny about it beforehand. But it, it that's still getting its own up and this is getting it up as well. He was then clearly inspired by the fact that the Undisputed Era were reflecting on their, their history in NXT. So he chose to reflect on Pat McAfee's squad's history. So he was talking about how Pete Dunne's an absolute machine, absolute monster. And uh, obviously he was bigging up only Larkin, Danny Burch, who kept chiming in with this like hell no thing and then there was a point where if they would have said hell no they would have looked very stupid so Pat McAfee was like I'm not going to give you the chance which did make me laugh quite a lot but then I think the most interesting thing out of all of this was the fact that towards the end Pat McAfee was just going on an epic tirade which is just what he does now and Pete Dunne just grabbed the mic and said no nope, what we're going to do is we're going to end the Undisputed Era that's it and it was just boom cut and dry no nonsense no just embellishing or anything else he was just like no nope, I'm going to batter him and then Pat, even Pat McAfee was like, the guy who said nothing has just summed it up. This is a, this is a promise we're going to make right now. This team is going to batter the Undisputed Era. And to be honest, the look on Pete Dunne's face suggests that that is definitely going to happen. And I'm a little bit scared for them. Okay, so something that we mentioned a little bit last week. And we give it, a, I think, a very quick down because I was just confused by it. I'm still confused by it, so it's still getting it down. I'm, of course, talking about the whole Zia Lee Boab thing that's going on in, I'm assuming, a garage at this point. Uh, the duo this time... We're being 
drowned? Well, like, they were, they were being forced to, like, dunk themselves underwater and they kept coming up for air, like, oh my god, this is awful. And then the master type character was like, again, do it again. He was like, okay. It was uncomfortable to watch, I've got to say. It was a very uncomfortable situation to see unfold in front of you. And... I'm not sure where it's leading because then after this they went and stood in front of this this mysterious figure with the hoods and the nice nails and everything else with the hair going over the face and an eye that you can just see very grudge like and it was looking like okay maybe we're going to get a reveal now or at least a progression in the story to, to see where they're going to go next but we didn't get that they just got smacked in the back with a kendo stick and that was it they just like fell to the ground and then we moved on. So it's still getting it down because I just, I, I don't get what we're doing. Okay, straight after this, we had the Grizzled Young Veterans. They were going to have a big match now against Everrise, obviously the team that they attacked when they returned last week. But that match did not happen because Imperium just popped up and nudged Everrise out of the way. They were like, oh, again, this match this is our match. And then they had an impromptu match, which was great. It was super hard hitting exactly what you'd expect of a Grizzled Young Veterans versus Imperium match, which just saying that is mad that this was just thrown in at the last minute. We had no hype or build to this obviously that was the story but it was just bah it was brilliant and the match delivered because of course it was going to deliver look at the teams it was there was some of the hits were just sickening some of the slams and everything else and they did not pull any punches because they were trying to establish themselves both teams as the new like number one contenders for that NXT Tag Team Championship but the big curveball here was that Ever Rise the team who've pretty much been the biggest goobers the biggest goofballs in this division suddenly popped up towards the end of the match and threw the entire decision out because they attacked everybody they caused the DQ and now it's looking like we're going to this weird three-way rivalry over the number one contendership for the NXT championships, which NXT tag team championship, sorry. So that's I'm I'm interested. But what a what a sudden change of events for Ever Rise. Suddenly they're now looking like the team to cause the chaos. They're probably gonna get absolutely battered by Imperium and Young Grizzle Veterans, but you know what? I'm kind of here for that. So if I didn't say so before, it's getting up. Then after this, we had Timothy Thatcher who popped up in one of his Thatcher's Thatch can lesson segment things in the middle of the ring. A live lesson with one of his students who was no doubt going to get absolutely battered. Like that's just what he does really in these sessions. But no, that is not what happened because Tommaso Ciampa popped up before Thatcher could teach us a lesson about how to avoid distractions, which, to be honest, is a pretty good lesson to teach because it happens an awful lot in the line of WWE. Then after going back and forth for a little bit, Thatcher just took down Champa, put him on the ground and started beating him up and then Champa got back up again it was like oh he's gonna get the upper hand but then Thatcher's student took a cheap shot it was a very cheap shot at Champa and Thatcher managed to get a sleeper in on Champa and choked him out so he's just choked out a former NXT champion quite easily it's got to be said in the middle of the ring and it's now well, it's been confirmed that we're gonna have a match between the two at TakeOver which this segment and the fact that we've got the match itself is getting an up. So I'm just going to put that out there. It's getting an up. The actual storyline behind it, which just doesn't make sense because Tommaso Ciampa's got a problem with the one person on the roster that seems to be cut from the same cloth as him. But none of that matters because the match itself is probably going to be super vicious and a lot of choking, a lot of smashing each other in the face, which is exactly what I like in my wrestling. And in the main event, we had Shotzi Blackheart taking on Raquel Gonzalez in a War Games Advantage ladder match, much like we saw last week between Pete Dunne and Kyle O'Reilly. And you know what? This one delivered just like last week's delivered, but I preferred this one, so it's getting an even bigger up. It's actually getting, I don't have anything yellow, so it's getting the yellow, orange jacket highlight marker. That's just not good. This match was, it was as brutal as what you'd expect of a ladder match involving Shotzi Blackheart and Raquel Gonzalez. Shotzi just threw her body everywhere. She had like a coffin drop at one point. And then Raquel Gonzalez got a face smashed into a ladder because Shotzi did this like over the top rope DDT slam head first thing onto a ladder. And then she did like a sent on onto Raquel Gonzalez when there was a ladder in the middle of the turn. But it just, there was some really brutal stuff in this match, which always makes me laugh because why put people in this kind of car crash of a match? just before they're going to be in an even bigger car crash on Sunday. But they both delivered. It was a great match in itself. But the actual closing stretch, the, the, the highlight of the entire night, in my opinion, was this closing stretch. Because just when Indy Hartwell had got the ladders up to one of the little pod booth things that had the teams in, much like last week again, and brought all the team down to ringside, and they were like causing a bit of chaos, and it looked like Team Candice's squad were going to get the advantage because of just the shenanigans that were going down. Io Shirai popped up out of nowhere. She did like a springboard thing onto the back of Raquel Gonzalez. Alice put her in a sleeper hole, brought her off the ladder, and she did a moonsault off the top rope 
onto everyone else in the field and I popped. I was like, oh my god, the XT Women's Champions back and she's kicking all the ass. It was great. It was so good. And this, of course, cleared the field so Shotzi Blackheart could climb to the top of the ladder, grab the briefcase and seal the advantage for her team. But if winning the advantage wasn't enough, Io Shirai being added to the team because she actually posed with the squad after the match, which does confirm in the land of WWE that you're part of a team because you wouldn't pose with them unless you were. So the advantage goes to Team Shotzi. Io Shirai is now part of that team, which is absolutely stacked. And the heel team stacked as well. This is, in my opinion, arguably the most star-studded War Games match we've ever seen. Don't at me. Don't even challenge me. It's true. So those have been your NXT ups and downs of the week. Let me know what you think of these in the comments section below. And do not forget to follow everybody here at What Culture WWE and follow myself on Twitter at gmorgan04. Please let me know. Let all of us know if you hear anything about Adam Cleary because he's just... He's got messed off the face of the earth it's a very concerning time but we'll take our minds away from it for now because we have a certain little war games issue to get out of the way this weekend i can't wait i bet you can't i will see you very very soon bye bye